The Cycling Podcast, live from Lionel's Lounge. With Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I am with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freib. Good evening. And we're coming at you live from, where are we, Lionel? We're in my lounge, live from Lionel's Lounge. The Cycling Podcast Live, our first experimental um, freeform jazz live podcast 30 minutes only this evening on air till 7 p.m first and last live podcast this is a this is a bit of a test run a dress rehearsal we're all appropriately dressed for our live podcast from the olympic velodrome on sunday where we are bringing you live coverage of bradley wiggins attempt at the hour record we're doing lots of podcasts this week. we've already recorded a regular show wrapping up the giro um, which will be available tuesday i think There'll also be a special Our Record preview show on Thursday morning uh, that's supported by Jaguar. Thank you, Jaguar, for that. And uh, on Sunday, of course, the live podcast. It's a busy old week, isn't it? Are there any days we're not podcasting this week? Um, No, well, we're not podcasting on Wednesday, but we will be recording things. I think we're due to see Bradley Wiggins, aren't we, in the velodrome on uh, Wednesday ahead of Sunday's Our Record attempt. Um, But this half hour, we thought we'd throw it open to our listeners, all our friends of the podcast, um, and answer some of the questions uh, we asked on Twitter an hour or so ago. If anyone had any questions. and They do. They do have questions. There's lots of questions flooding in. I I hope you're all listening. Because well, we don't really understand the technology, will we be? Will people be able to listen to this after the event? Yes, they will. Um, we will embed this on our website, so if anyone catches up, uh, well, they won't be listening now if they're missing the start, will they? But um, yes, they'll be able to listen again. Uh, we'll post it on our website. But uh, at the moment, our audience is growing in front of our eyes. We're very much testing out this technology um, this evening, and we're we're well into double figures of listeners at the moment. <laughs> Fantastic! That's better than normal. Daniel, um, you're just back from, before we get on to the questions, you're just back from Italy. Did you have a, a, a pleasant time over in Italy? Any Giro chat for us? Um, yeah, I was actually at the um, Italian MotoGP, um, which I'm not really interested in, but I was there. Um, I was supposed to go to the Giro. I was on a bit of a secret miss- mission, didn't make it up to the Giro, but it was cycling related, the reason why it was at the MotoGP. Well, that could be coming up in a future podcast. Who knows? Well, we get on with the questions. Well, at what point is one of us going to say, can we record that bit again? And realise that that's not actually possible for once. Our producer, Paul, is sitting here beside us wearing headphones and laughing knowingly at that. Um, so, come on, Lionel, you pick a question. Okay, I will. Philip Wilson asks, do you think Froome will be any match for Contador at the Tour? Yes, I do. Yes, I think it will be It will be the four-way race that we're anticipating between Chris Froome, Alberto Contador, Vincenzo Nibali and Nairo Quintana. And the first week will be the usual process of elimination. Somebody will have a mare on the cobbles. Somebody's team will fall apart in the team tri- time trial at the end of the first week. Um, somebody will get caught out in some crosswinds. Somebody will crash. Um, and we'll see whether all four of them make it to the Pyrenees intact. I was writing a, a story for a South African magazine today and I compared cycling's big four to the big four in tennis. Um, the uh, you know, um, I compared each one with, I mean, who would you, I, I said Contador's Federer, uh, you know, kind of long career, consistent, classy, talent, and perhaps the most talented of his generation. Uh, Froome is uh, Rafa Nadal. Same build, same physique. No, um, just because he came along and beat the the, the champion uh, Condor, I I'm sort of regretting this now. Um, I I said I said Nibali was Andy Murray because he's not very not flash but a hard worker. Um, and uh, Quintana, Nairo Quintana, is Djokovic, who is a prodigy who might just blow them all away. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think um, Froome is definitely the best on clay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not sure about it, that he is actually. Actually, that t- that ties in with another question. Somebody asked about um, the the penultimate climb of the Giro, Daniel Saturday stage, where uh, you were telling me off for my pronunciation earlier. Called the Finestri. Finestri. Yeah. Okay, that's close enough. Gone. Okay. Called the Finestri. It was it was a gravel road. It was it was a steep climb, and it came before the the climb up to Sestria, which was uh, more of a, a sort of motorway. It's it's smooth road, quite quite wide and it was on the um somebody asked i can't find the question now but whether um contador was sandbagging when he got dropped on that climb 
um, or whether that claim was just so hard that that was a claim that sort of found him out. What do you think? I think he was struggling a little bit. I think he's got one eye, obviously, on the Tour de France, doesn't want to go too deep. But he was also, as we mentioned in a previous podcast, using all of his experience, I think, throughout the Giro and was very aware of the fact that he was very vulnerable with such a poor team. And Astana was so strong. Um, that he he knew that he could manage his advantages. His manage his advantage was over four minutes. Um, there was no real need to take any risks on the penultimate day. I think he would have loved to win that stage, but he realised quite early he didn't have the legs to do it. So I think there was a bit of sandbagging. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions to get through, but one's just come in. A live question's just come in. I I can't. I'm afraid I can't pronounce his name. Um, but the question is, who is the most boring pro you've interviewed? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, do, do any of us want to answer? <laughs> Here's the most boring, most boring interview of your career. For a lot of honour. Um, Damiano Cunigo is pretty bad, I have to admit. He was on Italian TV during Giro. Um, pretty damn awful, nice guy. Most of them, they're all nice guys, the, the boring ones. But, um, <laughs> well, they are, aren't they? I mean, that comes with the territory of being boring. Um, but, yeah, support for choice in that category, I think. Does it come with the territory? Can you be boring and not a nice guy? There's a that widens it out from cycling, perhaps. Maliciously boring. Yeah, <laughs> I've done some interviews where it's felt like the subject has been maliciously boring. Um, it's not his fault, but Edvald Bosenhagen is very hard work. Where he's just not. He has no real interest in the history of cycling or really cycling. Yes. <laughs> yes. Basically. That's that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly. Uh, I, I was going to say Edvald Bosang as well. He's an, a nice bloke. Uh, actually, that kind of backs up your theory there, Daniel. What's our next question? You've all moaned about race nomenclature. <laughs> At the end of the day, the, na- the name chosen for a tour is a proper noun. Jonathan. I think we know him. Let's not let's not bother with that. That was part one of two. Jonathan, you can knock number two on the head. Um, Tinkoff. Uh, Oleg Tinkoff creates as many headlines as his riders. Is he good for cycling? Asks Phil Walton. Is Oleg Tinkoff good for cycling? I think time will tell on that. Um, There's still a lot of instability around his team. I think, you know, no one there has had any discussions about contract renewal um, for, or certainly the riders who are out of contract. Um, however I I understand that the situation has sort of calmed down in the last month or so a lot of riders on that team feeling a lot more settled and stable than they were actually when Bjarne Reese was there and there was this power struggle going on between Tinkoff and Reese. so that's as far as his team is concerned at the moment Um, you know some well, a lot of other team managers, team owners roll their eyes at him, and um, and others think that he, you know, is bringing a lot of exposure and a, a lot of headlines, which cycling needs. Yeah, I think Oleg Tinkoff is very good for Oleg Tinkoff. Um, he dyed his hair pink to celebrate Alberto Contador's victory in the Giro. I sometimes think he perhaps is. Uh, taking a little bit too much credit for his team's successes and hands out a little bit too much stick. Um, when the team don't live up to his expectations, I don't see it, I don't see him as a particularly even-handed boss. Um, you know, he he he. Too much of what he says in the public domain is, uh, you know, ends up making the Tinkoff Saxo team look less good rather than making them look better. Mm. Dave Brailsford wouldn't have dyed his hair pink like that, would he? <laughs> as, some, as somebody pointed out. Um, yeah. Next question uh, is well, Tinkoff. Um, we we had. We've probably mentioned this in the podcast before. We had Oleg Tinkoff over as guest of honour um, to the Cycling Writers Christmas dinner. Um, and it was a very interesting, <laughs> eye-opening experience. Uh, he is clearly somebody, we, we spoke to him, he's clearly somebody who's very passionate about cycling and the passion appears to be very, very genuine. Um, but he was remarkably uninterested in what anybody else had to say or in anybody else, full stop. You know, he, he basically held court for um, an hour or so and he was surrounded by, by journalists and some of them were quite experienced, some of them had been around for quite a long time. They, they could have had interesting things to say perhaps, but he didn't show any interest whatsoever in anything that anybody else said um, and he just uh, sort of held court on, on his thoughts on on his team in particular and his obsession uh, i have to say with dave brailsford um next question from joe russell 
how would you rate Brian Cookson's work so far as president of the UCI? Well, we have Brian Cookson on our forthcoming Friends special, which is uh, looking at the doping question in particular in connection with the the CERC report. Um, and one of the questions I remember you asking him, Daniel, was along the lines of a lot of his, not it's not ruling by committee so much, but there are a lot of decisions appear to be delegated to committees and so on. And there isn't perhaps the strong individual at the helm there's not this perception of there being a, a an individual at the helm in the way that there was under uh, pat mcquade to and, and certainly hein verbruggen his predecessor um and and brian explained this to us as a as a positive thing but um i don't know do you feel that there's perhaps a need a requirement for a str stronger leadership yeah i mean it's a difficult balance to strike isn't it i i feel that sometimes there is maybe a lack of accountability in the sense that everything seems to be delegated now and that everything seems to be independent which of course is what we lobbied for what we wanted for for years and years but um sometimes it does seem to be taking it a little too far and that's certainly what i've been hearing from riders and team managers over the last few months all, all, most of the complaints um, directed at cookson are about a sort of lack of strength in his leadership a lack of um, a lack of a, a, re a, a figurehead really for for the UCI and a lack of a kind of firm hand steering the ship. That's certainly what is, like I say, the most common criticism that's being levelled at him at the moment. On the positive side, I think we can, I think what we, what we don't sort of question or doubt is, is Brian Cookson's uh, commitment, determination to doing the right thing. He certainly wants to do the right thing. And I, th I think sometimes he gets involved in, small spat stories that he shouldn't actually get involved in uh, a couple of examples being the the minor stushy as we say in scotland over the um the outfits worn by the colombian women's team um which caused a sort of storm on on twitter and in mainstream media as well i think he should just have kept out of that and and the, the story about lance armstrong riding um bit of the the tour de france as part of a charity ride this year i just didn't see any need for him to get involved in that at all and on the subject of lance armstrong a question from kieran doherty um and this is directed at daniel did lance cheat at golf free boss no he didn't uh, well as far as i know i mean i probably wouldn't know i'll have to consult the um the the hidden camera footage that um but no he didn't um I probably gave him too many putts in hindsight. I was very generous. I gave him a few three, a few three footers that um, if I was to play him again, I, I wouldn't be so generous with. No gifts. Uh, right, next question. Um, one for free boss. If gravel climbs are the next big thing, which ones should Le Tour use in future? Daniel being a resident uh, climbing mountains expert. I would have to do some research on that, but I think there is a possibility that the tour will venture into Italy in search of that kind of climb in the future. And the Colle delle Finestre that with the Giro did in future is certainly um, at the weekend is certainly one that's been mentioned and certainly one that is handily placed in terms of logistics. I mean, you could easily have a finish going over the Finestre and finishing at Sestriere as the Giro stage did at the weekend in the Tour de France. A quick update. Um, Earlier, I struggled with the Gaelic spelling of uh, our questioner's name. It's Kevin <laughs> in Gaelic. Sorry about that, Kevin. I'll know in future. Uh, next question. Um, can you Have you picked out a question there, Lionel? There's so many. Well, Tim Frost asks, um, it's a bit late to the party, but have we had a is Richie Port finished as a Grand Tour contender question yet? No. Ha we haven't had the question or we, we're answering the question? We haven't had the question. <laughs> Well, is Richie Port finished as a Grand Tour contender, Richard? No. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Next one. Next one. Uh, what's gone wrong at Garmin this year? They're having a mare, says Alex Bevan. Cannondale Garmin. Cannondale Garmin. Uh, th we've addressed this to a certain extent in previous pods. Um, they, they haven't got... The, a roster with many sort of bankers i think you know you look at any team that doesn't have a sprinter prolific sprinter or perhaps a, a time trialist who's likely to win races and um, is exposed is in danger of having long barren spells in the season and if you looked at garmin Cannondale's roster at the start of the season you would have said that that was a team that could easily get to 
April, May without having won many races, and that's what's happened. Um, I, I actually think that they've redeemed the first half of their season with a really excellent Giro d'Italia with a, a, a team with some experience, certainly with Tom Danielson and Ryder Hagedale, but not a team that's fancy to do very well. But they were in a fantastic stage with Davide Formolo and Hagedale rode a fantastic Giro. So I think um, given the budget they've got, given the riders they've got, I don't think they're doing too badly. Here's a question from Ollie Wright. Uh, this quick fire question. Where do you think the free agents will end up next year? Uran, Port, Landa, Zacharin. Uran, Daniel. Uran, I think, is likely to stay at Etix, but it's a tricky one because they have not got a huge amount of money, not as much money as people would imagine. Um, certainly not that much money left over when they've paid everyone else. Um, and Lander is a, is a name that has been mentioned in connection with Etix Quick Step. So, you know, it, it could be that Patrick Lefebvre, if he's talking to Lander's agent, might be um, weighing up the, the pros and cons of, of Uran against Lander. And it might be that Lander takes his place at Etix next year. And um, Port will stay at Sky, I'm fairly sure. And um, Zacharin, I have no real lead on that. I would suggest he'll probably stay at Katusha. And Landa, we think Mika Landa might be skybound as well, perhaps. No? I, I just said Etix is what I've heard, but um, Sky... Right. Sky I wasn't listening. I was looking for other questions. I, Sky were certainly interested in him a couple of years ago when Uskatel, um disbanded and they picked up Mikel Nievi, who I thought was a little bit disappointing at the Giro. Um, question from Colin Barnes. Astana scare me. I don't think it's the uh, I don't think it's the colours. Too much like US Postal and too many rumours thinking the Greg Henderson tweet. Honestly, guys, what are your feelings? Well, we spoke about this quite a bit in our regular podcast, which will be going out on Tuesday, but no reason why we can't address it briefly again. We did talk a little bit about not being that sure as to the overall standard um of the top 10 in the Giro. You know, we saw the same characters at the front every day. Contador clearly was a very good and strong winner. But really, was that was that a, 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 a top 10 of top caliber riders apart from Contador? It's hard to tell. And that, of course, could put a bit of a false gloss on the Astana performance. We didn't, we certainly, I, I you know, you can't be unaware of all the the chatter on on Twitter and so on, but to some extent, you know, we've had we had this in 2012 with Team Sky, we had it in 2013 with Team Sky. It's it's it comes with the territory that a team that's going well, that's performing outstandingly well, and has seems to have have numbers up there, will attract suspicion. And I think particularly Astana, given the stories that have dominated or prevailed around them all year leading up to the tour it fits a narrative doesn't it that Astana are the dirty team are the, the the evil team and to see them performing so well does for a lot of people raise eyebrows um I think we tried in our discussion earlier to step back from that a little bit and and actually look at it in a, in a sort of more rational way and and I don't think I don't th I'm not aware of um of anything to suggest that it was that there's anything suspicious about about the performance they're 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 good riders as daniel's made the point in previous podcasts they are they are all good riders on earning a lot of money yeah i think the difficulty is that you can look at absolutely any factor in a bike race and lead it back to the question of of whether or not a rider is doping if somebody comes out of nowhere they're assumed to be doping if somebody is consistent and is always in the the first few places they're assumed to be doping if somebody has a good you know run of good days is that doping if somebody has a you know a one bad day amongst four good days is that doping if two riders from the same team do well on the same day is that doping if different riders from the same team do well on consecutive days is that doping and so on and i think that we need to sort the of take a step to back that is to always be rubbish well, <laughs> there is that, yeah. If you're if you're always rubbish, then you know you don't get the suspicion um, you know, coming your direction. But there aren't the same questions about you know um, Stevan Kruisevic. There aren't the same questions about Ryder Hazedal, um, who've had very strong final weeks in the Giro. So um, it is because of the history. It's because of the man who runs the Astana team, Alexander Vinokurov, who has served a doping ban. Of course, it's because they're fairly opaque when it comes to um, talking about doping themselves. Daniel. Um, a few th few points. Um, 
it was a the, the Giro turned into a real head to head battle between Tinkov and Astana. Now Tinkov have had real problems this year with the the training with some of their riders that, that they've there've been a lot of complaints from riders in their team that they've been working too hard and they've had to really reassess um how they're training you know how they're coaching some of the riders um and I'm led to believe that that's been remedied now however there may well be a legacy of this very very difficult training that Tinkov did early in the season they went to altitude extremely early um Aru has spent a lot of time at altitude but didn't go until February um, I think Tinkov already there in Mount Etna in January so that's one issue also I think Tinkov picked a, the kind of team that you would usually pick for a Tour de France a lot of guys who are good on the flat and a lot of very very experienced guys and rather than a rather than pack their teams with mountain climbers and it didn't really work so um you know they're they're further reasons which might to a certain extent explain Astana's superiority over Tinkov Tinkov were also just training up Kilimanjaro back in November or something they did a trek up uh, Kilimanjaro uh question from John AD uh after seeing testing at the Giro do you think it's realistic that teams could be using motors and bikes Daniel or Lionel the consensus about this among riders is that it is impossible um, or it hasn't happened. However, the, the 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 approach the UCI are taking to this issue suggests to me they really believe that it has happened or is still happening. Um, and, you know, Lakeet today have published more or alluded once again to rumours about Alberto Contador and his bike, not just in the Giro, but in previous races. And it, it just doesn't seem to go away, This, uh, particularly with regard to Contador, I've heard a, a lot. Um, but uh, I, more, than, more than finding out whether people have been using motors, I'd be very keen to know what information the UCI are getting and, and why they are so... Um, intensely pursuing this issue yeah i mean there have been rumors since 2010 haven't there where it, re- it really surfaced during the classics when um people were suspicious that fabian cancellara might have had a motor in his bike um earlier today in fact i watched on youtube a um, package done by a belgian tv station vrt in which johan museo and uh, a 48 year old amateur cyclist from belgium basically had a race up the old aquilamont in in belgium one of the longer cobbled climbs first time up the amateur cyclist went on a regular bike and was left behind by museo second time up the amateur cyclist had the motorized um, assisted bike and um, he dropped museo for dead um, and then this amateur cyclist also used it in a kind of amateur kermes race just a circuit race um, and you know the conclusion is that the technology obviously exists um, the fact that you say are um, are carrying out the test says something but i think the unfortunate thing is every day they publicize um, the fact that they tested so-and-so's bike so-and-so's bike you know it points a finger at those riders um obviously if they kept it quiet and and carried out this testing without telling anybody then they'd be accused of trying to cover it all up so they're really in a no-win situation and it is up to the uci to police this it's up to them to find something and really until a bike is found um then we're we're going to be asking the same question over and over again and those who believe that the motorized bikes are being used aren't going to be satisfied by the fact they haven't been found they're going to be thinking well they're just hiding it um you know flawlessly yeah i mean the question i suppose is not whether the motors help but whether they're being used uh, in this bite in this video was it secreted enough that you genuinely it was invisible to the naked eye uh, from the external um, look at the bike, yeah, but um, you, you'd need to take it apart a bit, um, and they, you know, it's clear how it works. I witnessed uh, the the UCI bike test um, at the end of a stage of the Tour de France last year, the one that Michael Rogers won in the Pyrenees. Was that in uh, Luchon? Perhaps it was in Luchon, and I I started taking a picture on my on my iPhone, and I was told not to take a picture. But from what I could tell, they took the saddle out, they held the bike upside down, and gave it a bit of a shake. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know if it's much more sophisticated than that. I saw somebody suggesting that maybe infrared or something could be used. I, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, it's surely a good thing that they are that they are testing because that will surely act as a deterrent. I mean, that it's being treated in, in, as an equivalent to a doping offence, isn't it? So that the punishments would be similar if you were caught. So the risks, therefore, are huge. Um, 
and it, it can't if if you're doing that there must you know there, and, and the bites are being tested there must be a huge risk that you're taking and we've talked about this a bit before and daniel we you had an interesting theory on a writer's pride that with doping you could rationalize it is still your physiology it's still a, the effort is still being made by the athlete whereas a motor and a bike just destroys that and no athlete could rationalize that no athlete could could convince himself that he's not cheating as i think athletes can do sometimes with doping don't, don't nod daniel that's not going to work what have you do you want me to ask another question all right da everybody daniel just nodded um to that oliver jones asks at your tunbridge wells event yes we did an event at tunbridge wells at the end of last year i asked for which riders uh, it was 2015 a make or break year has anyone passed or failed so far can't remember who did we say <laughs> did Tony Sagan did we say um it's early isn't it it's too early to say I mean anyone can a one-day rider who's failed in the classics can still save their season with for instance the world championships but um, to an extent Richie Port has has um, failed um he the first test well, I think he's not really oh, though. Well, I mean, well, the first no, that's true actually with the with all the the smaller races that he's won. But um, I, I think it is too early for to really pass any kind of definitive judgment on anyone. Like that, all the small races, you know. Wow. You haven't been speaking to Mark Cavendish lately, have you? <laughs> um, I think I mentioned. I don't know if I did mention, but I'll just a quick mention for Joe Dombrowski, who moved after two disappointing years from t uh, Team Sky to Cannondale Garmin and he's been riding decently he rode well at Tour of California I watched the US Pro Championships as well and he had some bad luck there but rode pretty well and it's good to see him I think he's a great talent it's good to see him starting to maybe fulfil that potential another question um, Lionel did you have one there? Well yeah which, which is the most hipster Grand Tour Giro or Vuelta it can't be the Tour de France right says friend of the podcast Luke McLaughlin I actually think that the Tour is now so uncool that it's become cool again so the Tour de France is now officially the, the hipster's Tour de France of choice Daniel? What would be the most hipster non-Grand Tour race Daniel as a resident I hipster? So I consider the, the Tour of Portugal to be a Grand Tour and the hipster's Grand Tour because it used to be 20 something stages long it used to, up until a few years ago it was still um i think well actually even now it's the longest race on the uci calendar outside of the grand tours i think that the amsterdam derny race should be uh revived uh, i think it bit the dust in around 2002 um it, it was kind of in invitation race held in the late spring so may time it was a basically a road race with the riders paced by motorcycles the derny motorcycles similar to the ones you see in the kieran on the track i think michael bogard of um Rabobank won the last uh, event i think that would make fantastic television but unfortunately the race no longer exists i think we're nearing the end of our half hour aren't we so we'll have to knock it on the head soon we um might do this during our, our record broadcast might take questions as we go who knows if we if we get bored we can take questions about the uh are, are we not going to have our hands full working out whether Bradley Wiggins is up or down on Alex Dowsett's record? That's actually your job, Lionel. You've been uh, that's we, we we figured it's best just have one person concentrating on distance covered, while Daniel and I provide a bit of colour and atmosphere and stuff. And generally try and enjoy ourselves. You're setting me up to fail here, aren't you? Got a really good question here from Carl Dolan. Um, Carl asks, what role could the panel? That's us. What role could the panel see for Set Blatter on cycling if he left FIFA? Maybe honorary, honorary president of the UCI. That might, that might become vacant soon. I could see him riding one of those dernies that Lionel just <laughs> talked about, no? No? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, uh, podium boy, maybe. He could do the the Eno job, couldn't he? Or um, or be a bus driver. I mean... He looks a bit like Bru uh, There's a, a French photographer called Bruno Bard who has been working for L'Equipe for years and years and years. He looks very like Seth Blatter, actually. Well, there you go. Um, are we, Paul? Do we? Should we finish here? Nodding vigorously. So we'll we'll wrap it up there. That this is our first ever live uh, podcast. Um, it's been fun, I think. And we will. We've just got an, a lol from somebody. So I think that's a vote of confidence. Lol. 
Thanks, lol, back to you. <laughs> Uh, we'll probably do this again. We might do this at the tour if we can uh, find um, if they have the internet in France now, um, which I think they do, and we'll be able to find good Wi-Fi in places, and we'll we'll do it there. But um, thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>